cakes and snacks and ready to go. I am ready here. We do a lot of talking, so I got my big cup of Coors uh, Rockies water. Um, so anyway, I'm going to turn myself off so we can get going so you don't have to look at my face any more than we have to. Uh, welcome, everybody. Boom, there I go away. And hopefully you can see me now. Uh, we are rocking and rolling. Um, we're going to get started because I don't want to delay and take any more of your evening than we have to. So we'll get started. All right, I'm going to make sure I got a volume. All right, so uh, guess what? On our first slide here, you can see it is May 21st, and we are smack dab getting into severe weather season. Um, typically, we see the last couple of weeks here in May, first couple of weeks of June is kind of our peak here for severe weather season in eastern Colorado. And to exemplify that point, yesterday we had tornadoes up in Weld County. And we had actually four, uh, I think four confirmed tornadoes. Uh, what we're gonna try and do is get out, uh, we did some survey stuff and tried to get some uh, information put together on that storm. And we'll hopefully have something on our webpage here over the next uh, day or so, we'll get that out to you. Uh, but season is upon us, tornadoes in Will County. You wonder why nobody else got any severe weather. We'll talk about a lot of those issues. And uh, a few things that came up and I will, um, address some of those um, about yesterday's uh, tornadic storms as we saw. Um, and even today, um, southeastern Colorado was under the threat. They had some pretty large hail uh, golf balls up to baseballs up in down in uh, Holly, Colorado. Those remember Holly got hit by a pretty good tornado many years ago. So let's get rolling. Um, a few Make the clicker work. Okay, here we go. All right, a few housekeeping items. Again, everyone set up mute, so feel free. You can cuss at me. You can bark. You have your dog barking. That's okay. Um, we, uh, you can send if you have a question along the way. Uh, you can send a written question, and there's a question chat box. You'll be on your uh, webinar computer. And we'll try and maybe answer some of those questions at the break or at the end. I know last time around we had so many, you know, we had like 600 people on the call. There's just too many questions. We'll see what we can do today. And um, if I can't get to them, or at least some of them, I'll put together a Q&A um, that will um, hopefully answer most of them after the fact. Uh, we will have four polling questions during the webinar. And... Um, there's also some handouts attached. I know folks are the first time around had trouble opening those. I've changed those to a PDF. Maybe that will work better. I don't know, um, but we'll, we'll give that a shot. Um, regardless, for new spotters, you will get those handouts anyway when I send you out a welcome email. Um, so that's pretty much it on the housekeeping stuff. So let's roll along. Um, right off the bat, um, we still get questions about storm chasing during COVID times. They are strange times indeed. So the weather service is deferring and any questions on spotter travel or chasing, you are supposed to refer to your local state, county, city guidelines about traveling in your area. Um, main thing is, you know, the protection of health and safety of our, the public. And that is a top priority of the Skywarn Weather Spotter program as well, including National Weather Service. We're all about the safety folks. So um, a, a big thing is just use common sense. Don't fight over space, whether it's your physical six foot space, or as you can see in this picture, vehicle space, um, that looks kind of risky, especially if there are tornadoes there. I know Colorado, we don't have that huge of an issue, um, especially if there's no research going on, but certainly, um, those kinds of issues can happen, especially on back roads, rural roads, where all of a sudden you've got a jam of spotters up and down the county roads. So again, basically use your common sense. All right, a little background with the Weather Service. Uh, we are under the federal government. We come, under the we come under the Department of Commerce, NOAA, and then the National Weather Service. We do have 122 weather forecast offices across the country serving you. And if we zoom into Colorado, um, our office here in Boulder and Denver, all that area in the pink that you can see, 
and that covers all the way up north towards the borders of Wyoming, Nebraska. Good going over to the far east, uh, Green and Pueblo in the southeast, and Grand Junction covers our western slope. Our websites can be accessed all through the weather.gov. Just throw a little forward slant, and for us, it's just BOU, and you're there. So why are we here? What is the mission of the Weather Service? And bottom line, it is the protection of life and property. That's all it is. And whether we're dealing with floods, tornadoes, lightning, wind damage, hurricanes, um, it's about protection of life and property. And that's why we're here. And you guys as spotters, or almost spotters, you guys can help us meet the mission because you're becoming an integral piece of that National Weather Service warning process. You're providing that ground truth from active storms using your variety of, of whether your phone, computer, ham radio to relay those reports. And the bottom line is your report may help save lives. You never know. So for those folks you wanna go out and do good to your community and be a good neighbor, here's your chance. All right, here's a little peek inside of our shop up here in Boulder, Colorado. We do run a 24-7, 365 days a year shop. We're always here. Weather doesn't sleep, so we don't either. Uh, we always have a minimal of two forecasters on duty, broken out into kind of a short-term and long-term duties. And during the summer severe weather season, we do have a dedicated severe weather forecaster um, here, usually I come in around 11 a.m. and work to about eight during severe weather. And you can see in the shop, we are trying to maintain our social distancing. Uh, we're keeping kind of still minimal staff, um, but if there's severe weather, we'll bring extra folks in, make sure we're all covered that way. All right, uh, just a little bit about our warning process. So in this map, it's kind of, it's busy. There's a lot of stuff, but there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, we're here in the middle at our forecast desk and we're just itching to hit that warning button right there in the middle. Uh, but we're gathering information from a variety of sources, whether it be computer model data um, over here on the left, uh, radar satellite observations feeding us in information, um, ground truth. And that's where we're going to focus a lot of our um, attention tonight in that ground truth of it. How are you guys going to um, give us that information? Once we have all those pieces together, confidence is increasing. Forecaster decides I'm hitting that warning button. It all gets disseminated to whether it's your phone, your local TV and radio, Noel Hazards Radio, or even some cities still have um, sirens. And that's when all things work, all nice and nice picture package there. Um, but some things don't always go right. Maybe we're not getting ground truth um, from these storms. Maybe our radar's looking, we're looking at storms way out in Sterling. And so the radar is limited on how far it can see. And so things can break down. The idea is we want to try and keep all those pieces working together. But we, again, we're going to concentrate on this ground truth portion of it, at least here for the next few slides. One thing on the dissemination, a couple, uh, since everybody's got smartphones most of these days, uh, a couple options here. You can go to mobile.weather.gov. Not a lot of fancy bells and whistles, but certainly bare bones. You can look at our forecast, radar, and all that good stuff. Uh, FEMA also has a good app out there, and it can also help relay those warnings as well to you. Most of your cell phones should be equipped through the counties or whatever um, app you're using to get those severe and tornado warnings on your phone. And there's a lot of third-party apps for those that want some more sophisticated weather, or maybe radar. Um, there's a bunch out there. You can just Google some of them. Certainly some you have to pay for, but um, it depends on what you want. All right, still on our ground truth. All those little green dots are all of our locations of our Skywarn spotter team. And you can kind of make out the cities and the interstates. Here's I-76 going up here. And after the spring, we've already accumulated, we're over 10,000 Skywarn spotter. So you guys are awesome. And after tonight, you too can have your own little green dot that will plaster up there. The idea, the idea is we can overlay your locations with the radar. And then so we can kind of correlate when storms are going over you. And we can easy access to your phone numbers, give you a quick call. 
So kind of a two-way street. You can call us, we can call you. Um, it's a good partnership. Amateur radio is another big one that we use during severe weather. We actually have a, a little location. You can see this picture in the bottom right. We have a spot for our amateur radio guys so they can come in and run the net, uh, be a net controller, and they're getting information from out their amateur radio folks out in the fields, and then they can directly uh, alert our forecasters to what they're seeing. Um, if you guys want further information or you're interested in being amateur radio, um, you can go to the uh, coloradoaries.org. You can see the link right there on the screen and get more information for the local districts and contact information. So if you want to learn more about being a ham operator, um, it's a great thing to get into. All right, still on our ground truth, we have Coco Raws, a program that was started out of Fort Collins after the uh, Fort Collins flood back in the late 1990s. And um, it's a way of getting, um, here's these nice four inch diameter ring gauges that you can get a hold of. Um, they're about 30 bucks, I think. Um, you can get those online. Uh, folks report their rain, snow, and hail um, kind of pretty much every day. So you can kind of see how you do against your neighbor. Here's a, they make these maps every day and you can, this is a map of Well County and all the different locations that reported precipitation on that given day. So um, it's a great program to get involved in the Net West National Weather Service. We're um, very tied closely to Coco Raz and so we're getting all that information as well. Okay, uh, making your report. We're gonna kind of cut this uh, reverse a little bit and give you the highlights first before we get into the thunderstorm structure and all that good stuff. But we have a dedicated severe weather line for you folks, and that's at 1-800-287-2498. We just ask that you reserve this for severe weather reports only. If you're just looking for a forecast, you can use our web or um, get on our regular line to get that information from our forecast. But we just really wanna keep those lines open for those severe weather reports that are coming in. And of course, you're, if you're local Denver, you can use the 303-494-2884. You can also send your report online and we'll talk a little bit about that. So if you click that link there and then there's a variety of, you can submit report, um, send stuff through Facebook, Twitter, email, um, all those kinds of things um, to submit reports. Also a way to get us reports is through social media. So we have our own Twitter and Facebook pages. You can send information through there. It's also a pretty good way of, of getting pictures and videos to us. And uh, it's also good use that hashtag COWX and or use that at NWS Boulder and that will get, um, that'll signal us right away that um, something that we should be looking at. So um, another way we're monitoring the data. A couple of things on reporting procedures. The big thing is, maintaining your situational awareness, um, knowing what the storms are capable of producing on that uh, in the current environment. Um, so that's knowing what the forecast is early in the morning. Are we under any kind of um, outlooks for severe weather from SPC? We'll talk more about those guys in, a little bit later. Um, is it gonna be a tornado day, a hail day? Where, where's the focus gonna be? So kind of always be aware so you're not caught um, with your pants down. Um, this next bullet, when in doubt, give a shout. Uh, we've had this happen a number of times where folks not sure really what they're looking at. And so maybe they're seeing a tornado, but nah, I don't know, I'm kind of far away. Um, and so they don't call us. Or on the other end of the spectrum, maybe they're in Denver and they see a tornado right over downtown Denver. Um, and they say, oh, well, they're probably getting thousands of calls. We're not going to bother them with another one. Well, yeah, we're probably getting a lot of calls, but we still want to hear anyway. Because uh, sometimes we got to figure out, are we looking at one tornado or are we looking at a multiple of tornadoes? So if you're not sure, go ahead and call us. We can have a, like a little two-way conversation and hopefully figure it out together. Uh, the next one, where are you? Location, location, location. Um, if you're in your home, that's great. We have those pinpointed on our maps, but if you're on the road, you can use lat longs, mile markers, crossroads. So if you're out in rural uh, Weld County, 
you can give us, I'm at County Road 28 and County Road JXX5, and uh, we can hopefully figure out where you're at. So again, when you're reporting specific location, give your spotter number and a detailed report. If you're uncertain about any of that stuff or what you're looking at, that's okay. Call us anyway. All right. Um, and here's just a few uh, few things to report. And these guidelines will be on those uh, sheets that uh, new spotters will get as well. Um, for the hail, anything half inch diameter is greater is, is um, sufficient. Wind gust 50 miles per hour, anything tornado, fall cloud, funnel cloud, wall clouds, uh, call us. Um, some rules of thumb with heavy rain and flooding. Typically, if you're getting an inch an hour or greater in less than an hour in urban areas, that's probably going to create some flooding issues at some point. And if you're in the rural areas, anywhere from an inch and a half to two inches in less than an hour, probably going to create some flooding. So give us a call on some of that. And that's kind of just general rules of thumb. Um, of course, any kind of storm damage. Uh, winter time. We're, of course, leaving winter, um, but a lot of our spotters report snowfall, wind, dense fog, freezing drizzle, all that kind of good stuff. Okay, uh, this slide kind of talks about reporting priority in an ideal environment. Um, so, of course, number one ideal way to report is through the phone. That way we can, if we have questions for you, we can ask them and vice versa. So example, I've got a tornado on the ground. Give us a call. There's no ifs, ands, and buts on that one. The phone call is, that's gonna get me in real time. Number two would be kind of reporting on the website. And this is more after the fact, because you gotta go through some steps, uh, figure out, you know, it's, it takes you probably a minute or two to put that all into the computer. Of course, by the time you get all that done, you send that report, the tornado's gone. So these are good for after the fact, historical, you know, maybe you got home and, oh, look at all this hail covering the ground. Um, or the next morning I had a foot of snow and those are good for reporting through the website. And again, if you wanna send pictures, videos, uh, you can send it through, our, through Twitter, Facebook, our webmaster email, um, just, and one thing, um, for the webmaster email, uh, we try and check that at least once a day, um, but if it's a real-time situation or you're sending us tornado reports, you know, the tornado's happening now, hey, just tell the forecaster, hey, I'm sending you some videos of this tornado. And of course, Coco Raz, again, more of a historical daily reports kind of after the fact. So there's our priority. Now, if you're interested more in all the more details, because I'm not going into all the details on sending the storm reports through the web, uh, there's more exciting things to be doing here this evening. And um, so we've created a YouTube link after the last webinar, so you can go ahead and view that on our website. And we also go into just venturing around our website, because so, a lot of the stuff is buried. So we will walk you through that, and we'll also walk you through a lot of the thing from the Storm Prediction Center's website as well. All right, a few things. Let's get into the weather, safety, and thunderstorms. Um, and this is a chart looking nationally, and this is from 2018, but it, it holds to you today. Um, nationally, more people, if it's, and we're going to basically look at these flood, lightning, and tornadoes, thunderstorm related. Um, so more people die from floods than any other thunderstorm related uh, phenomenon nationally, followed by tornadoes and lightning, at least if we're looking at the yellow bars, which are the 30 year averages. All right, it's a little bit different if we're just looking at Colorado and it all is surrounds with the lightning because more people die from lightning Colorado than any other tornadoes or hail or whatever. Um, this map here from Visala, this is going back all the way to 1959. Colorado is tied fourth in the whole country for the most fatalities at 148. Yes, we get a lot of um, issues with lightning. Uh, we get a lot of cloud to ground lightning. Uh, last year, 2019, 
Uh, we had one fatality with nine injuries. Uh, we usually average about two to three fatalities every season. So at least we're below that average. Uh, this chart was uh, made from our good folks down at the Pueblo forecast office, and this is lightning casualties time of day. So on the bottom, you can see the time, and the red bar is the uh, fatalities. So if you go right to 2 p.m., smack, that's when most people are killed by lightning. So any of this mid-afternoon, and especially if you live here along the front range, urban quarter, that kind of makes sense. Now, if you look further east on the eastern plains, your, I guess your, your focus is going to be a little bit more skewed to the late afternoon and evening. So those folks that, you know, you see the 7s, 8 o'clock, where there's just those few numbers, those are probably some of those fatalities that are happening, say, out in uh, Washington County or Phillips County. Uh, what can you do for lightning? Um, plan ahead. Get the forecast earlier in the day. So if you're climbing a 14er, you're planning a hike up into the mountains or some sort of activities in the afternoon, and then monitor the skies. Hey, things are looking threatening. You know, quit quit everything early. Just adjust your activities. Could help save your lives later on. Uh, from the lightning deaths, we did have one. This was out at Bear Peak Ridge, just southwest of Boulder. Uh, one fatality was male, 36 years old. We did have a minor injury from a female. It was a direct strike. This was a high risk event for a number of reasons. It was approaching the peak time in month. Uh, again, we're getting to that early mid afternoon. Uh, we're in July and it's along a ridge line, exposed areas, and they're a male. And I mentioned that, um, not the um, shoot us guys in the foot, but there's like a four to one ratio of male versus female. Um, for fatalities, and maybe it's part of that whole macho image uh, that, you know, we're not going to let a little lightning bother our little fishing trips and whatnot. So anyway, uh, that was in Boulder. We did have some other fatalities. Uh, this was um, an injury at Rocky Mountain Park, and at Devil's Head, there were eight injuries. This was 3 p.m. June 30th. Um, weren't sure climbers did uh, that were injured tried to seek shelter before the strike but it was unclear where and um so what we're going to do now is see if i can open this first poll up and we're going to give you i'll put the letters up here first so um out of these four so a do you think so what we're going to do is we want to minimize our threat of a lightning strike if we're somewhere in this area. So are you going to minimize your th uh, threat of being struck by A, remaining on this ridge line, B, moving under this cliff or this little cave area, uh, C, I want to get to this lookout tower because I want to have a good vantage point of where those storms are coming from, or D, if that's possible, Maybe get down into these clumps of trees, all right? So you can think about that. I'm gonna, the picture's gonna go away, but I'm going to uh, find our poles here. Give me a minute. All right, we'll put the first one up. And hold on here. We're gonna launch it. So you guys can think about it. I see we're collecting our votes. And we'll give you guys uh, probably about 10 more seconds here. Yes, I know you don't get to see the picture again. You just have to use your sharp memories to figure this out. All right, I see the answer. We've got 70% in. People are still pondering, maybe not sure. All right, we're going to close this out so we can get to the answers and figure out what happened here. Okay, I'm going to share it. Here we go. Here are the answers. Okay. The big winner was 46% chose to move under the cliff or face cave. 
33% descend to a lower portions um, in those trees. If you clicked D, that would be the best chance for you to stay alive. Uh, the problem is if you have B, so if you're hiding under that cliff face, that actually that lightning can actually uh, jump from rock, rock to the other. And can, so if you're inside, you could still get struck. So even though all of these you could have an issue with, D would minimize your chances the most. All right. So thanks for playing poll number one. All right. So now we are going to, I have to hide this again, make sure I'm doing this right. And we are going to move along. Yay. Okay, got through poll one. This was from Coors Field last summer, three hour delay. I don't know if anybody's there this particular day. Uh, that's a long time for be waiting for baseball. Of course, we've been waiting baseball now for two months now. So maybe we'll get some baseball later this summer, hopefully. Um, the interesting thing is that, you know, some folks are still hanging out there. There's lightning almost right overhead. Um, not quite, you know, when thunder roars, go indoors. That's what we teach you guys. Um, the interesting thing I kind of found interesting on the big jumbo screen, they had a good situational awareness where they showed the storm right up there. I thought that was kind of cool. All right. And then we have these what we call bolts from the blue. And as you can see from this thunderstorm, and you can see this lightning bolt coming out almost in the top of the storm and going way out away. So you can see bolts, you know, five, 10 miles away from the main storm cell. And so that's why, as a rule of thumb, we ask you guys to wait at least 30 minutes after the last audible sound of thunder before resuming um, your outdoor activities. And uh, that way, because, you know, a lot of times, yeah, you see the sun comes out, the rain. Um, and of course, he ended up with some hail issue where he got bonked right on the head with a hail. And, you know, and people don't usually die from um, hailstones. Um, as you can see, you can certainly get injured. And this guy took quite a wallop because, you know, you get some of those higher hail speeds or the larger stones, you can get over 100 miles an hour. So beware of the hail. Um, in the video, you know, I talked about, and this I think always creates a lot of confusion between watches and warnings. We'll address that a little bit later in the program. Always good to already have a plan in place. So if you need your snacks and your beef jerky and cheese and uh, have that already. Maybe you got a little refrigerator down in the basement, so you're all ready to go. Um, the Wednesday noon test. So if those that have a NOAA weather radio, we do do a test of those every Wednesday between uh, 11 a.m. and noon. Um, and of course, the big thing is, and this is the hardest thing to do, because if you hear the tornado warning, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to go outside and um, you want to go take a look what's going on. You've got your phone so you can take the pictures and videos. Uh, but of course, you know, we're all about the safety. So if you're under tornado warning, get to your basement. We'll talk some more about tornado safety here in a minute. And so, and again, um, outside, there is no safe place from a tornado. If you're in the house, um, stay off the top floors away from exterior rooms and windows that will give you no protection. So again, lower rooms, lower basements, interior rooms, maybe like a bathroom is gonna be your best bet. Mobile homes, go to a designated shelter if you can. Um, as an example, here was one of the houses with, that was damaged from the Windsor tornado um, way back when. And as you can see, Home structure is built differently. So if I was to take shelter in the garage, I may not have fared out too well. I probably would have gotten at least injured. Uh, the windows, again, notice they're all smashed out. Boom, biggest issue is gonna be that flying debris from the winds from that tornado. But you know what, your house is still standing. If I had taken an interior room, I probably would have been a-okay. Outside tornado safety, again, there's really no outside place, but there's places that are worse than others. Um, overpasses, bridge, underpasses, by trees, 
no, no, and no, and this no, because all of a sudden now you've got a traffic jam. If you're trying to get emergency vehicles through, that ain't going to work too well either. All right, moving along. Tornadoes, uh, one last thing. This is your last resort. Let me amplify this enough. You are out of safe options. But we do give you two not safe options, if you care. If that is your face-to-face -face with that tornado, is like, what am I going to do? Uh, first thing you can do is you can stay in your vehicle, keep head below the window level, seatbelt on, or you can abandon your vehicle and get into a ditch or culvert. The big thing is if it's a lower area below your vehicle um, and then it's a lowering area, so some of that debris might just move right over top of you. Cover your head, protect yourself from that flying debris. Again, each situation is going to be different and it's just your own responsibility how best to respond. Now, in this picture over here on the right, this is an EF4 tornado. And if I had taken either of those last ditch options, no pun intended, that, you know, here's a tornado smashed by the tornado and then the ditch is full of water. So we don't want you to drown either. But the best thing to do is, hey, it's a tornado day, there's a tornado watch, stay inside, don't be out in your vehicle, um, get into your basement. And that's all I have to say on that. Because what happens to cars and tornadoes, these things. We're at EF2 uh, tornado in Elbury County. You can see the tread marks as this vehicle flipped over and over and over. Here's a UPS vehicle that didn't fare very well either. Trying to get that package delivered, flying to Denver, and didn't quite work out. All right, let's move over to flash floods a little bit. Um, it only takes about 18 inches of water to float vehicles, just like it's a smaller vehicle. Two feet of water will float all of them, including trucks, SUVs, et cetera. And if you're just wading around in the water, it's only about six inches of water, ankle deep, fast moving water can knock you over. Remember, nationally, it's the number one killer of thunderstorms. There's a lot of uncertainty with water. So this picture on the left, down in Elbert County, how deep is that water? Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Hmm, maybe I should turn around. Nighttime flooding. This is from the uh, video. If you'd watched our presentation a couple of years ago, this is Montecito, California, dealing with uh, mud flow. Um, it's hard to see what's going on at nighttime. Very dangerous. All right. Uh, that's kind of it for the safety part of everything. And we're going to get into the meat of the matter and go right into our thunderstorms. Let me take a quick drink of water here. That is refreshing. All right. Um, so just like you're cooking in the kitchen, if we want to cook up a thunderstorm, we need some necessary ingredients from the atmosphere. And we're going to talk a lot about these all in detail here in a minute. Um, but one, we'll just mention here, moisture, especially closer to the ground. So higher dew points, these all add for fuel for the thunderstorms. Just like your car needs gasoline to run, thunderstorms need moisture and fuel to get them going. Uh, instability is a second ingredient, and that's the tendency for the air to rise on its own and lift, and a mechanism to make that air start to rise. So we need these three things. Now, we're going to talk, if, uh, we, if you're out and about yesterday, you know, we talked about the tornadoes in Well County, but if you didn't live in Well County and you were Denver or you're in the mountains, it was like pretty much clear skies. So we were missing most of this stuff. We certainly didn't have any moisture because we didn't even have barely a cloud, I think, in the sky. Um, and then even if you were in, under those thunderstorms in Well County, it took quite a bit of stuff from these other, um, from this three ingredients to make those thunderstorms. And we'll talk more about this. Moisture sources. So if we're looking for that deep, rich, low level moisture, um, sometimes we can even tap moisture coming in from the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see this arrow and especially getting into Eastern Colorado, especially you know farther out in the plains and typically 
maybe some of our more stronger severe storms out on the plains because sometimes our moisture is deeper, richer, more fuel for those thunderstorms. Of course, we can also get moisture coming in from disturbances coming off the Pacific Ocean. All right, let's talk about instability. That's a parcel of air. So if you look at this hot air balloon, if that's a parcel of air, and if it's warmer than that surrounding air environment, that's gonna become unstable. So we want hot, warm air at the surface, cooler air aloft to get this unstable condition. This is what we want in for thunderstorms. Now here's a side-by-side -side picture showing stability. Now the picture of this big smoke plume over here on the left, this would be considered an unstable environment. So once that parcel of air begins to rise, there's nothing stopping it. It's going up all the way up to that tropopause. Um, notice though, in the stable environment, the smoke plume or steam plume that's rising, and notice it kind of just levels off and stops. So what's going on? Well, you can kind of think of stability. It may be this, if you like, I just threw this picture up, this pot of boiling water. So you've got your heat source below, this is the sun. It's heating up and that steam begins to rise and it keeps, it'll keep rising until it dissipates. But what happens if I put a lid on that pot? Is that steam gonna to continue to rise? No. And that's essentially what's going on in a stable environment where it's trapping that air from rising up anymore. And you know, this picture on the right is, looks like kind of a winter picture. And even in the morning, most mornings, we have these low, we call low level inversions. Inversions are where temperature is actually increasing with height. Normally temperature decreases with height. So if when you climb a mountain, the temperature gets colder as you get higher. Uh, but in a stable environment, there's an inversion and temperature is actually increasing with height. And that's not good for uh, conducive for thunderstorms. Now that environment could change and maybe it takes all the way to evening. So like yesterday, we didn't even have storms even in Well County until well after I think six o'clock. So something has changed in the atmosphere where this stable air was able to take mother nature, just kind of pop that lid and let her rip. All right, so let's talk about some lint because this is the other ingredient that you're going to need. And, um, and then we had some of these issues with the storms yesterday as well. So there's a lot of different lifting mechanisms. And one is a, just the good old cold front. So you can see there's a wedge of cold air. And as this protrudes from left to right, it begins to bellow up these clouds. Usually there's some sort of a east or southeasterly wind ahead of it. And this convergence between air masses allows these clouds to billow up and become thunderstorms. Uh, another way is by a warm front. We don't see these warm fronts quite as much as we do if you lived in the eastern part of the country, but they're there. Low pressure systems, dry lines. Now here's the one um, that we had yesterday. So dry line is essentially is a boundary between very moist. So in this example here, we have very moist conditions uh, across eastern Texas and then moving into Oklahoma and Kansas, and then uh, very dry air has been pushing in from the west, uh, low, very low dew point air. And so it's created this boundary. We call this a dry line. And sometimes this dry line can focus as a mechanism for lift to get these thunderstorms going. And essentially, that's what we had here in eastern Colorado yesterday. This actually isn't the exact, uh, this is from a different day, but it kind of makes the point. This dash green line is the dry line. Now, yesterday that line was a bit further west. It was more of a well county and just east of the uh, east of Denver area through uh, Morgan, Morgan County as well. And then we had an upper level disturbance uh, that was off to our west and north that was going to provide some lift. And so here, this is a picture I took from yet last evening. Um, this dry line, this focus, and you can see these storms beginning to to uh, build up and along this whole line that's where the dry line was um, we can have upper troughs and disturbances now sometimes you need more than just one lifting mechanism so because we had that dry line most of the afternoon we were watching it on radar um, but it took also a front and upper trough and those combination of things 
who kind of has that cold front triggered and intersected that dry line is that's when things really started to get cranky. Um, a thunderstorm outflow. So from this animation here, thunderstorm sending up this big old outflow boundary and that can kick off additional storms as it develops or moves into other storms as you can see off further to the east. All right, another big one is upslope and this is common. So you may have heard the term, maybe watching your local TV news. And this is any kind of winds that are um, say here we are in Denver and we've got some sort of an easterly wind and as those winds hit the mountains it's forcing that train is forcing the air to rise and if there's moisture that air is cooling condensing and producing clouds and precipitation and so this is a biggie and especially in winter time um, and we'll talk about that because you know it's always upslope somewhere but it's not always the same direction so this map here and these low yellow arrows are showing the preferred upslope direction. So here in Denver, if you live in Denver, some sort of an east to northeast direction. But because of terrain differences, say you live down in Castle Rock or maybe down by Monument or Parker, your upslope preferred direction is actually more out of the north or even northwest. Because think about it. This is a whole area we call the Palmer Divide, and that's over 7,000 feet. So you've got a 2,000 foot elevation gain between Denver and Monument. And so northerly winds, that's going up the slope or up the mountain, and that's conducive to precipitation. So that's why a lot of times during a big winter storms, your higher snow mounts are always gonna be down here through Douglas and Elbert, and then of course up into the foothills where that upslope gradient is even factored even stronger. All right, and then um, Fort Collins, so southeasterly winds, because you've got higher terrain north of Colorado, we call this up here the Cheyenne Ridge. So that's upslope, and that's a definite, a big lifting mechanism here for Colorado. And we can see the lift, and there's mountains to just to the west of us can do that. So you can see almost you look to the mountains every afternoon, most days in the summertime, and you can see these clouds building up because they're getting some lift from that higher terrain. And if you got the winds just right. All right, so let's talk about thunderstorm types. We've talked about our ingredients. We've got everything together. Talk about our single cell, our pulp storms, our multi-cells, and then the big old boys, the super cells. So let's talk with a good old just single cell and figure out how this whole thing works. All right, we'll start here with the left. This is called the little towering cumulus stage. And the red arrows are indicating the winds in the, we call the updraft portion of the storm. At this point, there's no precipitation falling out of it. It's just beginning to grow. And uh, we'll refer to these, you notice these cylinders at the bottom of your screen here. This red cylinder indicates the upslope or the, the updraft um, into the storm. And we'll talk about the downdraft here in a minute. So if you're looking at this towering cumulus, maybe a picture would look something like this. So you've got this nice flat base, no precipitation falling out of it, and the clouds are beginning to build up. Not quite to the CB or the cumulonimbus types yet, but they're getting there. All right, and then let's go to the middle screen. This is the mature stage. So notice we've still got pretty strong updraft arrows here, but now that all that ice and hail or whatever is building in that updraft, eventually that's got to come back to Earth because remember, whatever comes up must come down. And when it comes down, it comes down in what we call the downdraft. Notice by these blue arrows here, that's the downdraft. Notice, so now we have a red cylinder up and the blue down. And visually, maybe it looks something like this. So your maybe your updraft is over here to the front and the right part of your screen. This fuzzy whiteness is your downdraft, maybe a little bit of a hail shaft in through there. Well, eventually, that downdraft is going to kind of cut off that flow of moisture, that fuel for the storm. And we end up in this, what we call the dissipating stage of a thunderstorm 
where now your downdraft is the dominant feature and there's it's because it's pretty much cut off any fuel or moisture coming into that storm and that is your dissipating stage so that is your life cycle of your thunderstorm and maybe this is how a cloud or your dissipating stage thunderstorm would look where you're still getting a little bit of precipitation this fuzziness falling out but notice how the clouds are kind of more wispy um, ill-defined unlike what we saw whoops right here notice here the cloud edges are very well defined that's indication of a strong updraft but notice here on the right everything is very fuzzy looking dissipating stage of your thunderstorm all right moving on so here's a, a good shot this is taken from one of our spotters last summer near dia um, nice updraft in here well developed cloud uh, base in here you see this we call this the rain-free base because the updraft is very strong. You can see the billowing clouds up and through here. It's building. It's getting to be a nice cumulonimbus cloud. Um, and then the downdraft. And you can see um, where it's kind of darker where this downdraft, maybe it's not quite hit the ground yet. It's just developing. And so maybe we're kind of transitioning from that towering cumulus stage to that mature stage of the thunderstorm in this example here. All right, moving along. Uh, so with single cell storms, we're essentially looking at weak winds aloft. And so a lot of times you will see well, no tilt. And that means, uh, and I'm gonna throw this little dash line, it's pretty much straight up and down. So you know when your updraft's going up and it comes down on itself and then it ends. And so a lot of times uh, these cells will typically, you know, peak afternoon heating, intense updrafts, but that downdraft is gonna be pretty quick. Um, so short duration, maybe you get a five, 10 minute um, wash of rain and hail to come over yet before that begins to dissipate. But again, you can see again, well intense updrafts, well-defined cloud edges here. Think of cauliflower or broccoli, and that visually is gonna tell you strong updraft. So that's with our single cells. Now, with multi-cells, and it's just made up of um, a lot of little single cells. It might be along a boundary or a front, um, but it's gonna have multiple cells. And you can see a series of up and down drafts along this linear portion of this storm. Now, each cell may only last 30 minutes, but the life cycle of that cluster could last several hours. Um, usually still severe weather, typically still more isolated and of short duration. And then here's kind of a cross section through our uh, multi-cell. So you can see the old cell and through here is kind of going from the surface all the way up into the atmosphere. Uh, storm motions moving from left to right. Uh, here's your old cell, but it sends out a down graph. And if that meets, if there's some inflow coming in, it might develop a new storm. And this sends out a downdraft and it develops a new storm. And so these can continue to go on and on. What are the biggest threats with these multi cells? Or if we're looking at squall lines, uh, these could be long lines of storms. Um, notice this here on the radar, uh, they can extend hundreds of miles. The main threat with these guys is straight line winds. We can see winds up to 80 miles or 100 miles per hour. Um, and then sometimes we get what we call these bow echoes. This is where that leading edge um, accelerates ahead of the main line. So here I kind of indicated this in this dashed line. This is your bowing part of your echo ushering out ahead of the main line. And this again, this is the area where your biggest threat for damaging winds would be. And then we get to the big old boys, the supercells. Now with the supercells, not just any updraft, but now we're gonna be talking about persistent rotating updrafts. And this is important because it's going to help transport the precipitation away from the main updraft. And this is gonna allow the storms to survive for longer periods of time. In contrast to when we talked about the single cell and multi-cells. Uh, these are the storms, you're gonna get the biggest hail, 
the longest track tornadoes, and the most damaging winds. So we'll spend quite a bit of time with them. Well, and like any regular thunderstorm, we still have to have our three main ingredients, but with a couple of additions. And it's all going to revolve around the wind. And we talk about wind shear in two types. We have speed shear, and that's just meaning the winds are increasing with height. So maybe the winds are calm at the surface. Maybe at mountaintop level, they are from the south at, say, 30 miles an hour. And then maybe up over 20,000 feet, they're from the west at 50 miles per hour. And then maybe at jet stream level, they've gone around northwest at 100 miles per hour. So we've got a lot of speed shear in the atmosphere. The other component of that is the directional shear. That's where the wind direction is changing with height. And we'll have a couple of examples to kind of show that. So I'm bringing up these, remember our cylinders are red as our updraft cylinder, blue is the downdraft. So in a weakly sheared environment, as indicated here on the left, the winds are weaker going from left to right. And notice these are more of your single cell. Storm goes up, goes down, end of story. All right. In a strongly sheared environment, now look what happens. A stronger wind from left to right is going to displace my downdraft cylinder downwind so they can both exist in perfect harmony. All right, and we have a simple background toy uh, that will help demonstrate shear. And this is provided by David Floyd of uh, the Goodland Forecast Office. Uh, this is a very simple yet very illustrative. Um, so let's pretend, uh, here's our water hose and see the water is going straight up. And so let's pretend that water going straight up is our updraft. And this is in a weekly shared environment. So it's a calm afternoon. So if I stood under that water hose, I'm probably gonna get wet, wouldn't you say? All right, so what happens now if I increase the winds from left to right, what do you think is going to happen to that water? Let's find out. Whoosh! And there you go. So now, if I'm under, if I'm standing under there, I might even stay dry. But all of a sudden, you're going to do it again. Ready, set, boom! And so now, I still have my updraft, and here's my downdraft. They're both existing, and that's what the wind shear. At least when we're talking about speed shear at this point, it's going to do for us. All right. We can see this speed shear in these storms. So we're going to see a lot of these time lapse. This is from Mike Oblinsky from Vorticity 2. And um, yeah, let's what happened there. I want to play that again. Here we go. And so you can see the tilt in this storm. So the winds are, for example, maybe they're 20 knots here towards the uh, base of the storm, but they're 50 knots way off. So notice the tilt, notice with this dashed line, it's not straight up and down. When we looked at that one pulse or single cell storm straight up and down, but you've got that certain tilt. And so now you, this red arrow is indicated by your updraft or rotating updraft. The downdraft is displaced well off to the right. So it's going to tell you, that eh, storm's probably going to last a little while. All right. We can see speech directional wind shear. So in this example, you can see these lower clouds kind of going from left to right. The clouds above it are actually coming towards you on your screen. So that's telling you the clouds are moving in different directions. And I've probably got a fair amount of wind shear going on in that storm. All right. Oops, I think I moved my cursor at the wrong screen. Yeah, all right. So um, with the shear in supercells, and you can play this at home, you can see this red too, but you can say like put a pen in the palm of your hand if you've got one handy. And during a calm early morning, the pen's just gonna sit there, but say you take your other hand and you raise it above the pen 
and you brush against it and your pen is going to start rolling. Kind of like what this red tube is rolling. We get what we call these horizontal rolls in the atmosphere. A lot of times we can even see these early even in the morning in the radar. And it'll pick these up. And then once we get enough heating by this green arrow, we can develop, start developing these updrafts, developing into these storms. And now my horizontal roll is getting tilted in the vertical. And so now I have a vertically rotating updraft. And this is going to help lead us to this supercell rotation in the atmosphere. All right, we're let's talk more supercells. Uh, there's a bunch of features, visual features that you guys will be able to see and make out. Um, kind of examine these stars. Hey, this is a supercell because I see this, this, and that. So let's talk about these mesocyclones. Um, this picture here is a, a day 2017 in Weld County, and um, they had three distinct supercells. It's taken from Michael Charnick, who's a meteorologist over the Grand Junction office. And you can see these striations in the clouds, and that's indicating that there is rotation with this mesocyclone in the mid-levels. And here's some more examples. And again, you'll see these striations for corkscrew appearances in these mid-levels. This is taken from our emergency manager out in Sedgwick County. Again, here's another one from our spotters. And again, Notice these striations here. Again, more from Michael Blinsky time lapse, and you can see this rotating supercell. Most ro uh, supercells will be rotating kind of in this counterclockwise uh, rotation. We'll let that play here a minute. This would be probably considered a LP, or we call a low precipitation supercell, because notice it's pretty void of any precipitation falling underneath it. You can also have HP or high precipitation uh, supercells. Of course, more prominent, more probably over the central plains. Okay, the next feature you'll be able to look at are wall clouds. The wall cloud is a lowering of that rain-free base that you can see in this picture here. That air is rising so rapidly, it's developing this lowering cloud. It's in the strongest updraft region. And these are important because we want to really watch for rotation because it become it could become the precursor of a tornadic storm. And of course, not all wall clouds are going to produce tornadoes, but it's certainly something to be aware of. And so you want to watch for persistent rotation in these clouds. And so if you're seeing this, go ahead and call us. So this is kind of the, where I dash this whole area in white is kind of your whole lowering wall cloud. Here's another picture of a wall cloud. Again, you want to watch for persistent lowering motion. Again, strong updraft. Sometimes you'll be able to see this slight slope downwards. This will be a slope downward towards the precipitation area. This might be also another clue to tell you this might be a wall cloud. Again, report these to our office. And again, here's that kind of that slight downward slant that you can see. All right, and here's some from our Viero webcams, courtesy of Mike Nelson over at uh, KMGH. And you can see the initial wall cloud. I'll probably play this again, but it, eventually it was obscured by the downdraft and the precipitation. So here's that lowering right in here where you can see the cursor. And again, you got to be careful because you know you, you don't know maybe this will develop a tornado, but if you're on the particular on this view of the storm, you're now getting obscured by the precipitation area, that wall cloud or maybe produced tornado. You're probably not going to be able to see it. Then we got to jump to a spot that might be on the other side. All right, so let's try and put it all together with these supercells, and we'll kind of talk about some of these parts. Some of these we will cover a little bit later on. Here is our rotating updraft under our, call that rain-free base. Again, this will be where your wall cloud and or tornado would be. Again, we're talking supercells. Your downdraft, your precipitation are gonna be off here to the right and north or east and northeast. If we're north is top and east is to the right. Um, this flat pancake-ish looking cloud is what we call the anvil cloud which we'll talk more about later, as well as this 
overshooting top. Again, very important visual features when we're spotting storms. Over here, we have a flanking line. So if we have additional, um, maybe we got some multi cells and they're continuing to feed additional cells coming into this big supercell. Again, to reiterate our point, again, another picture of a supercell rotating updraft all in through here. Again, a nice rain free base. It's because the updraft is so long, it's kind of all void of precipitation into it. And down here, we see the downward motion where all the precipitation is. Um, again, both coexist. Again, there's our rain free base with a strong updraft. Uh, here's some just pictures from uh, spotters. Actually, this is another one from Michael Charnick. I like this one. He called this. Uh, this is out in Nebraska, beef for the side of pancakes, like a stack of pancakes. Kind of making you hungry, isn't it? Um, I might have to have some, get some syrup. Um, so anyway, you can see these striations. Again, noticing that rotation. Um, sometimes you'll see this, what we call this inflow band, moisture getting sucked into the storm, sometimes also known as a beaver tail. Here's another picture of a different one, but again, Again, you're seeing some of these same supercell features that we've been talking about. Updraft in here, rain-free base, downdraft where it's all dark and ugly. And here's a nice better shot of that inflow band or that beaver's tail. It really does look like one. And here's another supercell time lapse from, from Mike. And again, you can see a really good example of that striations and that, that rotation that we're seeing with that mesocyclone. Again, your downdraft um, coexisting with your updraft, rain free base on through here. Looks like just to the end there, something's developing. It might be even just a little bit of scud. It's hard to say at this point what's going on in there. All right, uh, the third feature we'll talk about is the rear flanking downdraft or RFD for short. Um, and Research has shown, at least in the past, um, that this is one of the one of the components that might help um, bring that or help develop that tornadic storm from these supercells. Um, your main key as spotters or your visual key is this brightening of the clouds, where it's becoming brighter and whiter, and so this might become the precursor of a tornadic storm. Uh, here's kind of a four panel of formation from the RFD to tornado. Um, notice in the here in the upper left, you can see these clouds beginning to brighten. And over here in the next time frame, skipping ahead, notice it becomes brighter still with this whole rotating um, mesocyclone wall cloud into here. That leads to a tornado and eventually that um, so a lot of times this once that rear flanking downdraft rotates through the storm, it will cut off that inflow air and your funnel will eventually weaken. We call what we call roping out. Now we're gonna have um, some interesting discussion a little bit um, about some newer research um, that will maybe play a, a even a more of a different light on this RFT tornado formation. So there's your with those brightening clouds. Here's again another time lapse of a kind of a brief life cycle tornado, and then you can see how it goes into that roping out stage. Play that one more time. So you can see full fledged tornado on the ground, and then bah, right in there, it just it, be, it becomes weakening, roping out, just left with a funnel at this point. All right, so let's take a look at supercell from a different vantage point from the uh, top view and see so my little spotter dude he's going to be helping us he's waving you can wave back and so we'll kind of orient ourselves around the supercell we kind of start in the middle you see the t t is for tornado yes and again that is where your rotating updraft is just off to the um, the north and northeast or to the up and to the right of the picture forward flank down there so this is where the heaviest precipitation where your biggest hail is going to be just to the north and northeast 
ahead and here is your forward flanking downdraft. That's where all your precipitation um, in that initial downdraft is going. We talked about rear flanking downdraft. It can be rotating back around the storm like this or in the, the other way as well. And then here's a corresponding radar. Um, so we can match up the T and especially in the old days of weather radar, this, notice this kind of little bit of a hook appearance. And that used to be the major way meteorologists warn on tornadoes. If we saw this hook echo, we would warn on it. Notice the red, this is very high reflectivity. So this is probably your, your strong hail is Oklahoma City tornado. Um, so again, just to the north, northeast quadrant is your heaviest precipitation of rain and hail that you would expect your leading edge or your uh, forward flank downdraft to be way out ahead up and through this area. All right, so let's play a little game. Uh, we're going to have our spotter guy and say now his vision, he's looking off to the um, north west so if he's in the southeast quadrant if there is a tornado with a storm he probably should be able to see it most likely unless it's a, a wrapped tornado um, and maybe even there's rear flanking down there so let's see what he sees and voila whoops i hit the wrong button there we go so again here's our wall cloud tornado um, notice the brightening clouds here, and that's probably our rear flanking downdraft that's been rotating around. Now let's move him way over here to the east. Whoops, um, I'm trigger happy here. And now he's looking back to the west and northwest. So at this point, he's watching this initial forward flanking downdraft coming right out. What is he expected to see? This. And so we're looking at outflow. This initial cloud feature that you can see where my cursor is, this is what we call the shelf cloud. This is the leading edge of the precipitation that's falling here. Um, what else I wanted to say? And here's some more pictures, again, from some of our spotters. Again, this is kind of a real ominous looking one. It's like, ugh, I want to get out of the way of that one. Cool ushered air flow coming in behind the shelf cloud. Um, again, you might have a lot some straight line winds with this, typically not tornadic. Here's some more shelf clouds, beautiful pictures of from our, some of our spotters um, that have come in. And we invite you guys to take pictures, videos, send them in. We'd like to incorporate new stuff into our spotter training every season. Again, here's your leading edge shelf cloud in through here and in through here as well. Again, here's some more time lapse from our famous photographer, Michael Blinsky. And there's a variety, here's some shelf clouds in through here. Here it comes, boom. Here's a nice, here's from left to right, leading edge. Notice the white precipitation ushering in right behind it. All right, well, here's a little side by side to kind of give you differences in comparison between your wall cloud and your shelf cloud. Your wall cloud on the left, typically it appears more blocky, lowering appearance. And again, remember, it's where the inflow under that rain-free base. In contrast, remember your shelf cloud is more of a linear feature and associated with that storm outflow along the leading end of your front. Um, typically, will slope away from the rainfall area uh, remember, we talked about wall clouds sloping towards the rainfall area. Shelf clouds are moving out ahead of the rainfall area, um, wall clouds kind of staying in behind. So there's kind of a nice side-by-side -side comparison. Roll clouds. Um, don't see these quite as much, and I've seen actually very few over the years. Um, the main difference between your shelf and your wall cloud is there is no this, so here's your wall cloud in through here, but there's a detachment. It's not attached to your main parent cloud above it. The shelf cloud is, so it's connected. Roll cloud is not. Um, usually, again, associated with the outflow and along that gust front. And here's a good, nice kind of picture of these roll clouds that we got. 
from Mike. And here we go, moving along. Okay, we're still sticking on our outflow theme and wind hazards. So um, outflow straight line winds. Uh, we can also talk about microburst wind damage. Uh, we can get a lot of these in Colorado, especially uh, the dry types of microburst. There's a wet and a dry. We typically will get the dry part because uh, you can see the schematics is that our air ushers downwards from that um, thunderstorm as it impacts the ground, it kind of swirls out. So you can kind of see this from this one, um, from one of our spotters, took this picture here, here, downdraft impact, and notice it swirls. So visually, it's gonna probably tell you, it probably got some pretty strong winds. All right, now when we're talking microburst, here's an awesome video down in Arizona showing microburst. And here's some animation. Notice this precipitation area. Um, in the downdraft, but it's going to really focus in. Notice this big ball, boom. There's your microburst, probably at least 60 mile an hour wind, probably more. That was impactful. Here's slow motion. You can see right there in the middle of your screen. Microburst. Um, planes are very fearful of these. We used to have a lot of uh, airplane that um, incidences that happened way back in the uh, especially in the 70s, and then now most airports equipped with microburst detection equipment, um, so help planes fly around these and not right through them. Well, here's a couple of pictures. Um, you know, everybody wants to be a tornado, but unfortunately, not everybody can be a tornado, and there's a lot of tornado lookalikes and wannabes, but they're really not, and so. First picture on the left was um, called in as a tornado or funnel cloud, and actually it is just Virga, and Virga means it's just pre precipitation that's evaporating before it hits the ground. And it's pretty common here in Colorado. I noticed that coming into um, the office here this evening. Um, high level cloud bases, precipitation trying, but not quite making it. Uh, I took this picture on the right on one day uh, kind of looked kind of ominous. You could, you know, sometimes we get funnel cloud reports mistaken, um, but it's actually only Virga. It's rainfall that's evaporating before it ever hits the ground. Certainly can be ominous or um, dependent on what side of the storm you're on, how far you are away from the storm, the distance. Visibility issues, not usually a problem here in Eastern Colorado unless we got some of that blowing dust. But you know, we don't live in New York City. We don't have skyscraper. Well, we do have Denver, but you know, in New York City, Denver. And then we have lots of trees back east. Um, our goal going forward is safely determining what kind of that updraft, is it rotating? What's the strength of that? So back to our top view of our supercell structure. Um, again, our spotter guide down here in that inflow side, we see these yellow arrows. That's where all the big moisture and energy is coming into. And um, as remember, when we look to the northwest, you could see tornado, downdraft. Uh, but what happens if I steer him way, now he's way up to the north and he's looking down to the south. Do you think he's going to be able to see the tornado from his vantage point? And the answer is no, probably not, because he's looking essentially right into the biggest area of the pre strongest precipitation in the hail, you know. And so visually, if he's looking down, it probably looks dark. Um, that's maybe the best he could do. Now, some storm spotters, and we do not advise this, it probably, now that I'm saying it, I shouldn't say it at all because when I say don't do something, somebody will do something. Um, a lot of people will, because um, they want to be usually to get that tornado shot, be on that inflow or that southern quadrant. And so um, they, what they do, they call a core punch and they go right smack through the storm. And if you want a damaged truck or vehicle with hail dings in on it, go ahead, feel free to try that for yourself, but it's not safe. You might even come face to face with that tornado and uh, um, probably not a very happy ending. All right. 
upper level storm clue. So they were far away. So like I was from my house looking at those storms in Weldon County last night, I could only see kind of the mid and upper level parts. So are you seeing the upper parts of the storm? Remember we talked about the cirrus cloud. Here's your cirrus anvil, this kind of flatter looking pancake stuff. And then you've got what we call this overshooting top. Notice the bubbles in these clouds above it. Well, what's going on there? We've got such a strong updraft. And when it gets to the cirrus, there's actually a higher level of stability in the atmosphere near the tropopause. And that's kind of slowing things down and things get sluggish, right? But if your updraft is strong enough, it's able to punch through that stability around that anvil and you get these overshooting tops. So as spotters, your visual clue and what it's telling you, if I see this overshooting tops and these well-defined edges in this storm structure, is you've got a really strong updraft in the storm. So it's probably maybe putting out some pretty big hail based on these overshooting tops. So look for those. All right, here's a good time lapse. This is from our Viero camera. This is from Holyoke. And we can see this. And I'll run through this again. Again, here's your nice anvil. Notice way up top, you see those little bit of bubbles. So you had some nice overshooting tops there. Probably weakened a little bit here in those last couple of frames, right here in the beginnings where you can see them the best. Boom, nice bubbles. Again, indication of very strong updraft with the storm. And again, you can see this nice flat anvil cloud with it. And with the anvil, we can get these interesting looking clouds on the um, on the underside called the Mahmatis cloud. And these are clouds that are developing in the kind of, there's actually a little bit of sinking air and they develop these little pouches. And uh, they not necessarily associated with severe storms. Doesn't mean a tornado is gonna form but they do make quite a pretty picture. All right, so we get maybe a little bit closer to the storm, We're looking at some mid-level storm clues, uh, looking at the main storm tower, again, looking for the cauliflower, the broccoli, well-defined edges, uh, strong updraft strength. Uh, maybe you're seeing 10 to 20 miles away, you're seeing that main storm tower. Um, the other feature you might be able to see is a flanking line. So you can see this little bit of cumulus clouds and they're kind of sidestepping and they're getting bigger and bigger as they get um, closer and closer to that main storm tower. Well, along these flanking lines, you might get develop new updrafts and further storms when we talk say like when we're looking at the multi-cells. Uh, accessory clouds. So sometimes and a lot of times in the outflow, so here's a shelf cloud. And we get these little bitty guys and they're called scud clouds. Sometimes they could be mistaken for funnels or tornadoes. Um, but with funnels and tornadoes, they're usually more persistent. Um, but with scud, they kind of appear and disappear and they don't mean much. They're not very organized or persistent. They form very rapidly and disappear just as rapidly. Those are scud Good clouds. All right, let's get to the tornadoes. Everybody loves to talk about the tornado, so we will talk tornado, especially since we just had tornadoes last night. So let's get through our very dry uh, AMS glossary definition tornado, rotating column of air from cloud base, contacting all the way to the cloud or the ground surface. Um, Sometimes can be visible as a funnel or even circulating with debris or dirt on the ground. Because sometimes you might not see that visible condensation funnel. There might be a gap in here, like right in through here where my arrow is. But notice you see this circling dust and dirt on the ground. That's going to tell you this, that rotation is actually extending the entire way. So that is a tornado. Do you guys know, and everybody thinks of Tornado Alley, you know, you think of what, Oklahoma and Kansas and Texas, Tornado Alley. But do you know we have our own Tornado Alley right here in Colorado? Look out, here it comes. Yes. And our next poll question is going to be, since we apparently have this, our own Tornado Alley, 
what county in Colorado has the most reported tornadoes since 1959? And I'm gonna open up the poll for our next question. Everybody ready to rock and roll and put in your answer, here you go. You can pick from Park County, Weld County, Denver, or Kit Carson County. Here we go, are you ready? And I'm gonna launch it, we'll give you a few seconds or so. And the answers are coming in. And well, you guys are pretty good in this one. I think we're gonna have a winner. We got 67% voted, 73%. Nice job, three quarters voted. So we're gonna stop her there so we can keep going. We're gonna stop the poll. All right, you guys ready for the answer? Answer is, oh, it doesn't show up on my screen. Oh, but you guys were good. It is Weld County. So 77 of you picked Weld County as the number one county. And that is correct. Because we're gonna, um, oh, I gotta stop this, stand by. All right, so here is a map, Colorado, showing tornadoes per county since 1950, 1950 through 2019. And for those that picked Well County, ding, 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 you are the winner, 285. Um, if you cruise around the map, most counties in Colorado have had tornado, even in some of our mountain counties, seven in Park. We had two up uh, by Mount Evans there a couple seasons ago. Um, but notice the numbers in red. 285 obviously is the big one. But as you get east of Denver, the numbers begin to increase, uh, especially just east of Denver. Um, Adams County is slightly more than even Washington County. Um, so why are these numbers so higher? And we'll kind of tease you for a minute, but we will answer that for you shortly. Because first, we're going to talk about some of the different types of tornadoes you might see. Now, from our probably common rope, skinny pencil-like tornado, very skinny guy right here, rope tornado. You might see something a little bigger, like a cone elephant trunk tornado. To our wider wedge tornado, this picture of the wedge tornado, this is from the Windsor tornado, very broad base, um, several miles in diameter. You can see with these wedge tornadoes, sometimes harder to see. Um, did I, I'm looking at my phone, are you guys seeing the screen? Um, did I not? Oh, okay, hold on. Oh, hi, Paul. Okay, I forgot to click this. Full sharing. Oops. All right, wait a minute. It just happened, uh, I have my phone on, and so I was glad uh, I caught that. Now I gotta figure out why, why, why? Yes, I'm not the most technical savvy guy. Where's the poll question? <sighs> Sharing. Dashboard. Sorry, folks. I don't even see my poll questions. Uh, drawing tools. <laughs> it's your screen.
cool. Okay. Boo. Hold on. I can't find the poll questions now to take it off the screen. Where did they go? Foiled again. Polls. There's the poll. Okay, hold on. I told that's what I forgot to do. Oh, there's me. Wait a minute. Stop webcam. Okay. <laughs> I'm just clicking away here. All right. Uh, all right. I'm going to have to go. Hold on. Okay, we finished the poll question, so I didn't get too far. All right, so you guys did not see the chart. So here's the chart real quick, county. So the big number winner is Weld County. Everybody, I think, is seeing this now. All right. Thanks for those who I was ignoring the question. They said, no poll, no poll. Here we go. Um, I'll have to be careful next time. So Weld County, and notice the counties in red, Adams, Washington, Elbert, Lincoln, pretty high numbers. Even more numbers in, uh, say, further east, where you would think maybe there would be more in Cedric, Phillips, Yuma, and Kit Carson County. Um, so there's a reason for that, and we'll talk about more of that a little bit later. Uh, different types of tornadoes from your rope tornado, I'll go through these really quickly. Um, cone elephant trunk, wedge tornado, Windsor, um, supercell, I guess is where I landed off. Um, supercell, wall clouds, mesocyclones, a whole ball of wax. And then there's another animal called the non-supercell or land spout tornado. It, yes, it is a tornado, um, but it is some of the reasons why some of those numbers are so much higher just to the east of Denver. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And so a non-supercell is like in this picture here, it almost looks like it's coming out of a towering cumulus um, thunderstorm or developing cloud. And, and so these guys are a little bit hard. Now this is, e these are easy. So you're looking at big supercell tornado, tornadic storms. Um, these are no brainers. You know, you guys could pick these out. That's no problem. But when we're dealing with non-supercell or land spout tornadoes, they're not as easy to pick up. It's not a no-brainer, and you got to be thinking a little bit. So I did this side-by-side -side, um, pictures of supercell here on the left, non-supercell on the right. Supercells, you're going to have that storm scale rotation that we talked about with the mesocyclones. You're not going to see this with land spouts. Um, with supercells, they're going to form more in the mature stage of the thunderstorm. Land spouts much earlier on in that stage. Typically, if we're watching the radar, we're going to be looking for a boundary, just like we saw yesterday with the storms in Weld County. Supercells, we're going to be looking for a large rotating storm, much easier to see. Usually, we have good warning verification with supercells, poor warning verification with the land spout stuff. Um, the good news is, even though we get more of them, the tendency is to generally be on the weaker side. And if you look at the enhanced Fujita scale, wind estimates based on damage, uh, we can see that in most of the tornadic storms we get here in Colorado are up to EF0 or EF1, so maybe up to about 110 miles per hour. So these are going to be mostly going to fall in our, you know, our land spout or a non-supercell category, where some of our stronger supercells. Um, would be in that EF2, EF3 range up to 165 miles per hour. At least in recorded recent history, we have not seen any EF4 or EF5 tornadoes in Colorado. Now, of course, I say this now, and then, of course, lo and behold, heaven forbid, we get an EF4 this summer. But hopefully not. We haven't seen it, at least since we started looking at data um, in the last century. All right. All right, so uh, here's, um, I had advertised some bonus material, and here it is. So we talk about uh, how tornadoes form, the evolution of tornado genesis. 
historically, and, all, and this is a lot of even a lot of the research that with supercell mesocyclone tornado genesis, it was all top down. It forms from you know you got your mesocyclone wall clouds. It all starts from the top and it descends downward. Historically, when we talk bottom up, always usually associated with non-supercell tornado genesis. Now, there's been some new research debunking the top-down tornado genesis. Um, and I'm just going to have a couple slides here uh, from uh, Dr. Jana Hauser. Um, and they, she did some um, tornado research, especially with the El Reno tornado um, back away. So here is a sampling of pictures starting at the upper left. And then we're going to go across in the middle and then down. But here's a sequence of this developing. And this was a wedge tornado. And if you're looking at it, and you might think, you know, we're dealing with a supercell tornado, that it kind of, yeah, here there's not much going on. Uh, all of a sudden we get a little bit of a funnel, and it looks like it's dropping down. And now I've got a full fledged tornado here and here. Only about four minutes have gone by. And visually, when we've always looked at supercells, and it seems like top down, it, it starts here at cloud base, wall cloud, mesocyclone, goes to the surface. Well, the research has now shown there is no evidence for top down tornado genesis. It apparently is a very rapid process, as quick as 30 seconds. So as spotters, our eyes and radar itself can deceive us because a lot of the early research with radar was this looks like top down, but apparently it's not. So as spotters, you can actually probably maybe focus more on the ground because uh, it's probably that rotation is likely on the ground already, but there's just no condensation yet. Don't always judge the tornado genesis by the visual manifestation, just looking at the funnel cloud. So you're watching this funnel and then, oh my God, maybe it's really already on the ground. So this is kind of interesting. We just had this presented to us at our one of our spring workshops and this is some newer research that's coming and we'll probably be doing some more looking into this, but uh, apparently most tornado or tornadic formations, whether it be supercell, non-supercell are all bottom up. So this is really very interesting. And I'm going to not do, I can wave my hands, you're not going to see them. <laughs> um, but basically, it's, you know, they're talking about horizontal vorticity along the forward flanking, FFD is forward flanking downdraft. It's ejected around the back side of the updraft. Uh, and then there's some more hand waving and mesocyclone strengthening in the low levels and pressure gradients. And we're not going to get into, we just don't have the time. Uh, but this is where some of this research is at least going anyway. And so we'll probably have more on this in future spotter training sessions. All right. Well, let's focus now on that um, land spout non supercell tornado storm. What's going on there? And there is a boundary, and we call it the Denver Convergence Vorticity Zone, DCV, DCVZ for short. Say that fast four times. And it develops when we have this, so this green arrow, if you have a fairly strong south southeasterly wind coming off the Palmer Divide, um, a good observation point to look at that is at the Lyman um, Observation Station. And as that winds hit to the north, it meets up some of this higher terrain along the Cheyenne Ridge. There's some blocking with this terrain. The winds turn, and it goes northwesterly on the west side of, of Denver. And it induces this low pressure system and boundary that sometimes becomes a focus for these non-supercell storms. Now, here's a kind of some animation of how this might look. So if we start over here on this far left, we can see this um, blue, this dashed line of these convergence boundary. A lot of times it sets up just east of Denver, um, comes up to about DIA. Yes, they didn't uh, consult the meteorologist before they built that airport. 
And in this boundary, a lot of times, you know, it'll stretch down maybe through Aurora and then down into Parker. And you got the low level easterly. So you got this convergence boundary where it's southeasterly, easterly is on one side and these uh, northwesterly is on the west side. Well, if you say you live in Boulder or up towards Longmont or Fort Collins, you know, when we talk about upslope as a good moist um, makes clouds and precipitation, well, these blue arrows are the downslope winds to the opposite. And so sometimes you may live in Boulder, Lamont, and you notice, hmm, we got missed again from these storms. Then you look out east, maybe towards Fort Lupton, and boom, there's the storms going, and it's all because of this boundary. And so some people benefit from it, some people do not. All right, here's a radar depiction. We can actually see the Denver cyclone. Um, right here, you can see this long extended boundary. And a lot of times we can see this in the morning. And so there's no precipitation, but it's a, a convergence of, we, the radar is sensitive enough. We can see a convergence of bugs and insects. And, um, and that can help us when we think, hey, storms are gonna form along this boundary, maybe after a certain time, and it gives us a focus for where convective, um, where it's gonna start. So when you guys are looking at non-supercell land spout tornadoes, a typical one might look like this schematic or picture, and where maybe you see a funnel up here, but you've got a pretty good gap until you look way down here at the surface where my cursor is, and you've got a little bit of circulation of dust and dirt. And especially with our dry atmosphere, there's actually rotation going on through here. So as a spotter, you've got to be careful to look at that entire column. So from cloud base where that funnel is all the way down to the ground. Because the correct call here would be I have a, a tornado on the ground uh, with debris. But again, there's a lot of times we can see this gap. All right, so funnel clouds. Funnel clouds, it's rotating clouds, condensation cloud from the cloud base, but it stops. There's no extension to the ground and there's no debris or dirt on the ground. It's just dingling, dangling up there and doing its own thing. All right, so our next picture, this was taken from last summer. And towards a view from the ledges of Long's Peak, and you can see we've got a nice thunderstorm going in. Then there's this little interesting guy here. And I hmm, wonder what's going on there. And a little bit of close up and say, wow, that looks like there might be a that might be a tornado or a funnel or something like that. Um, so our next poll question will be, how, if you're looking at this picture, just as a still shot, how would you classify this circulation? Now, now the pressure's under me not to screw this up. And so I will see if I can't do this correctly and then get rid of it. So are you guys ready? So you've got a little, little bit of the picture, your quest, your and quite, or your um, selections can be tornado, funnel cloud, or verga. And I gotta launch this poll. And here we go. So we're getting, votes are coming in. And I think we're gonna have a winner. We'll give you guys a few more seconds. All right, I think we have a winner. We're going to close this poll. And now I'm going to share it. And the winner is Funnel Cloud. So that's probably a pretty good guess. We're going to take this case just a little bit further. And I'm going to hit the hide button. So, yay, you guys can see again. If I got that right, phew. <clears throat> All right, so let's go take that further. Well, it just happens on that particular day. 
All right, now I got to have my cursor on the right screen. Then we had another guy. This is Brandon from the University of Colorado down at Colorado Springs. He happened to be over at Grand Lake looking up about the same time and the same date, and he saw this. And so completely different vantage point. You get a certainly a different look, but it gives you a little bit better, clear picture what we were seeing. Because before we said funnel cloud, right? But because of this ridge line, you probably can't make a complete determination what's behind it. You know, it could have maybe drop all the way to the ground and call it a tornado. But from this vantage point, we can certainly see that that is a funnel cloud. There is no extension down to the ground level. All right, so good job guys on that one. Nice. And here's the corresponding radar reflectivity, velocity, um, ever so hint of, of uh, some sort of circulation, but not enough that we would ever probably warn on it. All right, so there's the side by side. So again, and this goes to the point that whether it's in the mountains or on the plains, or you're on different sides of the storm, that we will take spotter reports from any location because each spotter is going to see things just a little bit differently. All right, now let's move on to the gust NATO or dust devil. And it's kind of funnel cloud in reverse because these dust devils or gust NATOs is a shallow rotation near the ground, but there is no connection to that cloud base. Kind of doing their own thing, dancing around here at the ground level. Short-lived rotation. Typically, you'll see these guys on the outflow winds with the gust front. Again, nothing connection there. It's not a tornado. It's gust NATO or dust devil, whatever you like to call it. Can cause a little bit of damage. You might see wind 40 to 50 miles per hour, uh, but not that big deal. Okay, so that's the gust NATO. So here's a side by side looking at the gust NATO versus land spout. So remember, gust NATO typically you're going to find on that leading edge of that outflow. So here's your storm outflow, gust NATO kind of in here on that leading edge of your outflow, where your land spout is going to be sucked in right under your updraft location. So land spout, weak tornado, right under the updraft. Gust NATO out ahead. And here you can kind of see um, with this outflow, you can see these little guys, see the little dust, boop, there's a guy, there's a little Gust NATO, there's one, they're going by really quickly. All right, here's a land spout scenario. This was from last March, 2019, and we're, we got a still shot from the Viero camera up by Alt. And um, a couple things going on here. We have this kind of low level boundary and you can see, you know, I'll take it off here. Nice um, bases here, but you can see these series here. So here's your boundary and you can see these series of updrafts. So there's these storms that are trying to go up along this boundary. And we get these little bit of tower and cube. Remember when we talked about land spout tornadoes a lot of times we'll see these on the boundary and if there's under a, a, an updraft push going into these storms. Now, obviously being this far away, you're not gonna see much. As for example, the land spout that was observed that day is right about where this red arrow is. Now, this far away, you guys aren't going to be able to make that depiction. You know, is this a land spout, a gust NATO? You know, just visually looking that far away, I'd say gust NATO, but who knows? Um, so then we use other spotters. So this from cameras or spotters, and then we take another vantage point. Uh, this was a guy from east of Eaton. And, um, you know, you can see this little protrusion, but it still is not clear. You know, say, oh, maybe that's a funnel, but it's not completely clear. And you get a little closer still. And then we had some video and visuals of actually a weak tornado on the ground. Uh, but again, it takes a um, 
takes a village. So you guys are our village um, uh, of spotters. I'll make one other comment on this as well. Uh, and this this shows up from time to time. Because a lot of spotters will, you know, if they send us a tornado picture, um, they'll show that close up circulation by the ground. And if if we're just showing that, and I get that picture, and I might, if I'm only seeing that part, I could just call it a gust tornado because I'm not seeing the full structure. So it's always good to pull back with your camera and get the big picture so I can see, you know, if, if I am looking at a landspout tornado, if I can, if it's coincided with one of these updrafts, that's going to give me a little bit better credence as, hey, yeah, maybe I do have a tornado on the ground. Um, so this kind of a summary of tornadoes, supercells, wall clouds here in the middle. Uh, here's an example, funnel cloud, again, from cloud base, nothing to the ground. And here's one where we had a gust NATO dust devil from ground based, but there's no extension to cloud base. So those are kind of our three different animals we're working with. All right. Um, tornadoes aside for a little bit as we go into a little bit of radar science. And I'll go really quickly because I know we are already after 8:30, and since we had questions and delays, and I'm going to continue to plow right through, because um, I know we've already been on here two hours. Um, so anyway, uh, the radar, the way it works, it sends out a pulse of energy, and it hits a storm, and it hits the hailstones or drops. portion of that energy comes back, and then it's displayed on the radar. And what the radar will then do, and it's scanning at a 360 degrees. It starts at what we call the half a degree and begins to tilt up and does another 360 and tilts up and up and up until it gets over 19 degrees. And so it's getting a lot of good information. It's slicing through that storm. And so there's a tons of data coming back uh, from this radar. And we can see a variety of different, uh, the base reflectivity, and these you can see off of our website. This is the base reflectivity. Anything in the oranges and reds are heavier precipitation. This is actually from one of the days when we had our um, uh, flooding back in uh, September of 2013. Radar reflectivity, the velocity, this is the, um, the product that's going to give us, showing us our circulations and showing up potential uh, for tornadoes. So we'll be, uh, and these are both available on our website. Uh, rainfall estimates, we, the radar can estimate rainfall. Sometimes it does a good job, sometimes not. So we will always like to get ground truth. So if you have rain gauge, um, you know, rainfall reports will help us immensely as well. As awesome as the radar is, oh, yeah, I forgot that was turned on. Sorry, that scared me. Um, I think it's going to boom again. Sorry. As awesome as the radar is, it does have its limitations. And so here's our radar over here on here on the far left. This is KFDG. It's at Front Range Airport is where our uh, radar is located. And say we're driving out towards Fort Morgan, we encounter Storm A. And here's the beam of the radar. And the lowest tilt, and we can see about, say, about 5,000 feet off the ground. And that's pretty good because then when we tilt our beam up, we're going to get a pretty good cross-section of Storm A. But as we travel east, now say we're up around Sterling, that lowest elevation scan our radar can see is now about 10,000 feet AGL above the ground level. And further still, say I'm out at Holyoke, I'm now at 16,000 feet. So now my question is, What's going on below 16,000 feet? And as a meteorologist, the answer is, I don't know. You have to tell me. And this is where critical ground truth information is important because the radar is tilting above that storm and we're not able to see what is going on 
underneath. Now, we might be able to see the mesocyclone, there's some mid-level circulation, but whether that's even close to the ground level, we just don't know. Now, um, which brings me to the point with the storms that we were seeing last night in Weld County, and these were land spout tornadoes, and they were overshooting the radar beam, and so we we're having a really hard time correlating uh, what spotters were seeing because it was above the beam level. So that's just kind of a little side step, side point of some of the uh, radar um, limitations that it has, as good as it is. All right, so we are coming up to our um, little bit of a case study here, and I'm going to show you some video, and um, it'll be, um, this is actually down from Texas. I usually try and keep most stuff in Colorado, but this was interesting. It created quite a bit of um, debate and questions in the offices and joining offices last summer. So I'm going to go ahead and play this. And you're going to start looking at this and kind of based on what we've been learning so far, what you think is going on here. You know, is it a tornado? Is it a gust nado? What's going through your mind? Think about all the things we've been talking about. And pretty soon we'll put up a, did it just stop? Okay, there it goes again. I'm sorry, I must have done something bad again. All right, so while you guys are looking, I'm gonna take another sip of water. Quite a bit of action going on at the surface. Still going. This is not an easy case as you continue to ponder. And we don't give you, I don't give you, try, try and give you just no brainer cases like, you know, you get with the big supercells. It is because we get more of this. You know, oh, there's something going on. Watch the bottom of the screen there. Zoomed in a little bit. Where we get all this crappy stuff where they're not supercells and they're just harder to see with radar and with the naked eye. All right, so that was the end of the video. And for our last poll question, I'm going to put up. And the question will be what type of circulation? Uh, I mean, let me launch it. Okay, there it's launched. What type of circulation, oh, excuse me, is best represented by this video radar presentation? Actually, you've just seen the video so far. You haven't seen the radar yet. All right, we're collecting responses. And I assume this is going to be a lot closer. And as um, it's neck and neck. <laughs> All right, we've got one answer that sure to head. So we get a few more votes in before we close it because it's pretty close, folks. I've got 44% for one and 40% for the other. A few more seconds, we'll close her. All right, I'm going to close the poll. Beep. Okay, I'm going to share the answer. Are you ready? Ding, ding. All right, so by a hair, the majority, 44%, picked land spout weak tornado. Very close to gust nade or dust devil. And as spotters, you're probably thinking, I could probably make a case 
for both. Now I am going to hide. I'm going to stop that so I can go back to my screen. So I did this right again. Yay. All right. We're going to continue on because we're going to add some pieces of the puzzle. And we're going to show you some radar imagery from this case. This is from Emeril's radars over here on the left, this gray dot here. There is a boundary here where you can kind of see where my arrow is stretching. And actually, I'll outline that in yellow. So this is, we have a weak convergence boundary. This is the reflectivity on the radar. On the right is the velocity. And you're going to be able to see along the same line, there's these little couplets here, here, and here, and I will circle all those. So we do have these little shear couplets rotating along this boundary. Okay. So there's, there's your radar piece. And, um, oh, what did I do? This is okay. Even though I put this poll in earlier, now this gives you a chance. If you had said Gus NATO or Dust Devil, we won't formally do this poll. Would you want to change your answers at all based on what you have additionally seen from the radar? So you can think about for a second, because a lot of times we don't have all the pieces to the puzzle. Even as meteorologists, we don't have it all. And then hopefully we get all those pieces and the answer, and we actually pulled um, some expert sources. So Paul Schlatter, our science officer here, Boulder, uh, a few folks are across the country, looked at this and voted on landspout weak tornado. Okay. The answer is why yes, um, radar showing a great shear signature along the boundary. There is a boundary. Remember, we talked about land spout tornadoes. They usually form along a boundary. In several instances, not all the time, but in the video, the cloud and ground base or cloud base appear to be rotating together. And when I looked at this without the radar, um, the, my conclusion was weak tornado based. I thought that there was enough rotation together. Uh, at times, it did appear that there was turbulent rotation cloud base. Um, the nays on this, or the only question mark on this was, was there a towering cumulus above the boundary, which would have meant that these were, it was forming along the updraft. And it was forming along the updraft. That was the only real question mark um, on this the storm. So this is not an easy case. And even amongst the experts, radar experts, there was differing in opinions. So that's, um, I mean, if you want to talk advanced spotter training, here's our advanced case. <laughs> Since we don't offer a real specific um, advanced tornado um, spotter training. All right. So with landspout tornadoes, a lot of times what you will see, and I think this, I'm not for sure, I haven't gone through the whole case last night. Um, you may see us issue, especially if we haven't seen any, gotten any reports from spotters, we see a boundary, we say, well, something might be happening. And so we might see us indicate not a tornado warning, but we call these special weather statements for a brief landspout tornadoes possible. Um, so you may see um, this kind of a statement come on your phone. This is one way a product we found that will work when maybe something might not be doing much, you know, very weak or minimal damage and not necessarily having to put out an, a big old tornado warning. All right, um, a couple additional things to consider. Again, it's all about safety, uh, videoing at safe distances. Um, again, I mentioned this earlier. If you're looking at this picture on the left, and there's doing all this rotation. Uh, yeah, it would be hard to say because I can't see the cloud base. The best thing I could maybe say this is the gust NATO because I can't see above. 
So always try and zoom out, like when we looked at this example from uh, Well County last spring, that, oh, look at this. I see all these towering queues, cumulus clouds, there's updrafts, and if I see, maybe there is this weak land spout tornado below. All right, so summary of this tornado designation, and this it's not always an easy thing. Always try and look at the full vertical structure from, uh, from the ground to cloud base. Um, do I have an intense circulation on the ground? Does the circulation at the surface appear to be connected to rotation at cloud base? If it does, it's probably a tornado. And if you're not sure, are there towering cumulus clouds above the circulation indicating that there is an updraft with this storm? Okay, enough tornadoes for a bit. Uh, I just wanted to alert you to a few of the different products. And I'll try and zoom this through quick because I know we're zooming in on turtle pacing at almost two and a half hours now. I know, sorry. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about SPC and the differences between uh, watches and warnings, um, especially since Charlie Barron's wasn't quite sure. And probably a lot of people aren't either. But if we look at this inverted pyramid, we want to start at the outlooks. And SPC is more outlook based. They also issue the severe and tornado watches. Uh, SPC is more nationally based. They're kind of looking at the big picture, the big scope. Um, and then the local offices are the ones that are issuing the, the final short fuse warnings. So let's look more at SPC. So this is a map of showing uh, a day one outlook and they update these several times during the day. The light green is kind of your garden variety, non-severe storm, marginal, might be a few isolated storms. The yellow slight chance and the enhanced is more in the this orange color where you're expecting a bigger chance of severe. Uh, most of the time, Colorado, you'll be in the light green or the marginal handful of times, slight chance, and maybe a couple times will be in the enhanced. If we're in the enhanced, chances are you're gonna probably get severe somewhere in that outlook box. So be aware of that one. So that's SPC outlook. So it's good to get in the habit, kind of taking a look at that day one outlook early in the morning. Hey, are we under a risk, especially for in the yellow or the orange? That's extra heightened awareness. Uh, another product off of our webpage you'll find in the bottom left is the weather story. And that's going to give you a kind of a visual depiction on um, what to expect over the next 24, uh, 12, 24 hours. This, of course, is a winter picture, but in the summertime, we'll put tornadoes and thunderstorms and all that kind of good stuff. It'll give you the impacts. What's the big threat of the day? So that's in the bottom left. The corresponding text product to go with the weather story is the hazardous weather outlook and if you draw your black line boom it's kind of tiny to see but it's there at the oops at the bottom of that there'll also be a spotter information statement indicating if we're expecting spotters to be activated on that given day and again when you uh, if you want to look through the youtube video, it goes a lot more detail on going through our website. So watch and warning. Watch, tornado or severe thunderstorm, again, issued by SPC. Conditions may be coming favorable for organized severe weather, but not necessarily occurring yet. The conditions are favorable, not happening. Issued multiple counties for maybe out to say six hours in advance. Warning, meaning and these are gonna, again, issued by the local offices. This would be our office out of Denver Boulder, meaning severe weather is occurring or is imminent. So, you know, kind of a watch, kind of getting ready, be on the outlook, warning means it's coming, all right? Uh, much smaller area magnitude and usually time duration under an hour. So here's your kind of your graphical look. Tornado watch in yellow here, covering a pretty good chunk of real estate across Colorado and even into Wyoming and Nebraska. Your smaller warning polygon shape size, in contrast, you can see this little guy comparison, much smaller. 
We don't want to warn folks that really aren't in harm's way. We can issue tornado warnings, severe thunderstorm, meaning at least 58 mile per hour winds or large hail greater than or equal to one inch in diameter. Flash flooding. Reporting hail, a few things. Um, bottom left, it's always good if you're sending us a picture, put a tape measure, a ruler, something that we can see the actual size. That's a good way to do it. But we've seen this a lot, you know, picture of your hand in the hail size or the, the hail ball. Um, everybody's hand's a little bit different size, so kind of hard to say. So yes on the left, no on the right. And if it's above 4.8 inches in diameter or greater, it could be a record hailstone. Preserve it and we'll get back to you. So again, anything quarter size or more is considered a severe thunderstorm. We still get reports of marble size hail. And in this picture, you can see not all marbles are treated equal. So no marble hail. It used to be the old, it was kind of like half inch generally. But as you can see here, um, they're not all the same. Incidentally, quarter size hail is about one inch in diameter. So if you've got loose change in your pocket, quarter size hail, give us a shout. And then we have this plowable hail stuff. This was taken in the pinery a couple of Mays ago. And you know, if you got a lot of, you know, if you got a little pea hail, you know, that's not too big by itself. But if you got six inches of it, that's going to create some impact. You got to bring out the snow plows. So we're working with the University of Colorado on plowable hail. So if you have that kind of a scenario, give us a buzz. All right, from last summer, uh, August 12th, speaking of hail, we had lots of big hail. Five confirmed tornadoes in Washington County, four inch diameter hail or possibly bigger in by Otis. And you can see, ew, um, that car did not fare very well, at least the windshield. Um, same day, we had one of our spotters, uh, Dan Fitzy, is out on the storm. Um, nice tornado on the ground. Uh, when we looked, we were flanked down draft, notice this brightening in here, probably indication of that RFD. One more day, day after, on August 13th, we had our record hail. Notice SPC's outlook, orange, enhanced, something bad's going to happen. Sure enough record hail in Bethune, Colorado. Um, state climatologists went out and record diameter 4.83 inches in diameter. Yikes, that's a big stone. Um, and so they, they'll go uh, So if you get something close to that size or even bigger, call us, we'll call the uh, climate center, have them come out and do all this official they even took some 3D computer stuff out of this upper right picture. So pretty fancy stuff, but some big hail. All right, we're at almost at the end, folks. It's good. Uh, I put this little checklist I thought is, is good to kind of get into a daily habit as trained spotters. Um, so when you wake up, of course, you got priorities. You know, you got to start with the coffee and donuts, right? Then go ahead, check the latest forecast at weather.gov. Boo. Um, are we expecting severe weather? Check that weather story. What's the impacts on that day? Check the hazardous weather outlook text product. What's the activation statement say? Check SPC's day one outlook. Are we under the threat for severe weather? Whether it be marginal or even the slight or the enhanced risk. Is it a tornado? Is it a hail or is it a flood day? Um, it could be you know, as we get later in the summer, we kind of transition away from the severe, the tornadoes, the big hail, and we get more into a flooding threat as we get into later July and August, and when we get to the monsoon moisture. Um, and then during the day, kind of just keep an eye on, hey, did the SPC issue a watch, you know, for the afternoon and evening? Is your cell phone charged and ready to go? Um, keep current with, you know, if you decide to download some of the local radar apps. Um, big things, stay off the road with, if you, if it's a big tornado.
tornado day. All right, and then this is our last page, which I will leave up. And so um, hopefully this will answer any last questions uh, for new spotters. Um, so your new spotter numbers letters will be sent via email based on your webinar registration. Now, hopefully you all filled that out, including your address and phone number, because I do need both so we can put you on our maps. There are two PDF handouts that will be included if you weren't able to download those tonight off of the webinar. And give me a week or so to, depending on how many, let's see, uh, at one point I saw 190 folks. So um, it'll take me a week or a couple, well, probably a couple of weeks to get this all done. Um, in the meantime, since we are smack dab in the middle of severe weather season, if you've got severe weather, call the office up anyway at 1-800-287-2498 to say you haven't got your spotter number yet, but I went through the trained webinar. All right, uh, existing retrained spotters. Um, I will update the information in our database. So if you change your address, phone numbers, I'll change that. But I won't be sending you any formal re-notification. So keep that in mind. Uh, spotter guides are available online. Those links are also on our website. There's also an online spotter training national.